decided to stand here, the very place 120, 30 years ago, the young people, that early 20s maybe, they dedicate their lives. And most, many young students came to the Korean Peninsula. It was called Joseon. And what they did, they dedicate their lives. And I'm, I am the Korean descendant. Came to the United States 1992. And I see that what God has done to my country was amazing. Last hundreds of years, Korea experienced massive revival. Anointing of the Holy Spirit came to the poorest country. And now that we are, the South Korea is a nation sending out missionary right next to United States. And as you know that for such a time as this in Korean Peninsula, going through a lot of tension, that we are praying, we've been praying for the last 70 years about the unification between North and South. You probably saw that the two leaders met together. I really hope and pray that God is doing something in this time with the United States Korean Peninsula has a blood alliance that we receive the blessing. So I'm so thankful. I want to say thank you all of you who were here, who've been praying for the revival because of that revival that was flew into Korean Peninsula, that we are here as a pastor and as a Christian family that we are having this joyful time because Hundreds some years ago, South Korea or Korean Peninsula was the darkest place, idolatry, no gospel at all. But because young missionaries came and dedicated their lives, we are here today. So I want to say thank you. Thank you so much for your prayer. I'm even excited to introduce Dr. Surgeon because when I heard the briefly read the bio that he went to China, around nine, early 19, uh, 1990s. He served with the International Mission Board among unreached people group in China. After a movement settled down, started there, he began to train for the house church network in China and other around the world in how to do the same in different regions. Later, he served as a vice president for the global strategy with the International Mission Board. Then amazing, after he's done the work in there, he came to the United States around 2004. He joined, he helped, he went to the Saddleback Church over church planting and helped catalyze some extremely large scale church planting projects, especially in India and engaged nearly the hundreds of odd people, unreached people groups. Currently now, he runs a disciple-making and mission training center called Meta Camp in Dadeville, Alabama. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Curtis Surgeon. Thank you so much. What I would like to talk with you about this morning is a little bit of an unusual topic, maybe. Um, it's asking a question for each of us. Am I a disciple worth multiplying? We often uh, talk about wanting to go out and reproduce for the kingdom, right? multiply for the kingdom. But it may be God's grace that that hasn't come. <laughs> um, I'd like to start by looking at Luke chapter 14 together. So in the passages leading up to Luke 14, Jesus has been going around preaching 
teaching, healing, performing various miracles, you know, feeding the multitudes. And so he's got quite a following. So in verse 25, it says, now great multitudes were going along with him. And Jesus turned to them and said, whoever does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not carry his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For what man, when he wants to build a tower, does not first sit down and calculate the cost to see if he has enough to complete it? Or else, when he has begun to build and is not able to finish, all who observe it will begin to ridicule him, saying, this man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king, when he sets out to do battle with another king, does not first sit down and take counsel if he's able with 10,000 men to encounter the one coming against him with 20,000, or else while the other is still far away, he sends a delegation to ask terms of peace. So therefore, no one of you can be my disciple who does not give up all his own possessions. Therefore, salt is good, but if even salt loses its flavor, with what will it be seasoned? It is useless either for the soil or for the manure pile. It is thrown out. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. I don't know about you, but to me, that seems a little bit um, shocking. It seems to me as if Jesus doesn't want all these people following him, right? He's got this huge crowd following him, and he turns and tells them this. From an earthly perspective, if I were to title this passage, I think I might call it something like, Jesus was a terrible marketer, right? I mean... I don't know much about marketing, but I'm pretty sure that's not how it's supposed to be done. What was he thinking? Because essentially he turns and he tells these people, if you're going to follow me, I have to be far more important to you than any earthly relationship, more than your life. You need to be ready to die for me Every day, everything that you own is mine. And I want you to really consider carefully if you're willing to do this or not. Because unless you follow me like that, you are absolutely worthless to me as a follower. Absolutely worthless. Not even worth putting on the manure pile. You're just to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. Wow, what a sales pitch, right? From an earthly perspective, that makes no sense whatsoever. And the thing was, this isn't the only time Jesus does something like that. In fact, it's not the worst time. I would propose the worst time was when he told his followers, unless you eat my flesh and drink your blood, you can have no part in me. And I base that on the fact that many of those who had been following him closely for a long time at that point left. And you remember then, he doesn't know when to quit. He turns to the 12 who had stayed and he says, how about you? Are you going to leave too? (laughs) And you just want to say, Jesus, just be quiet. Give it a rest. They might leave. And then you've got nobody, right? Right? but apparently he doesn't know when to quit. So what was he trying to do in that passage in Luke 14, 25 to 35? I would propose to you that what he was doing was testing the people's motives. Were they following him for entertainment? 
for education, out of curiosity, for healing, for a free lunch, or because of what he had been saying and what he had been doing, did they realize who he was? Because if they realized who he was, these demands are nothing. They're inconsequential. Of course, if he is the Lord of all creation, of course he is far more important than any earthly relationship. Of course he is worth laying down my life for him every day. Of course, everything I have is his. All creation is his. It's just an honor to be able to follow. And I believe that's what he was doing here. Testing the motives of this huge crowd that was following him. And so with that passage as a little bit of a backdrop, I'd like us to think a little bit more about what kind of disciple is worth multiplying in his eyes. You see, multiplication is God's idea, right? It's basically the first command. Be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth. And then you see the same thing with Noah after the flood, right? Be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth. We see the same thing, Abraham, Jacob, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, the same pattern, and it continues into the New Testament. If we're reading the Great Commission correctly, the Great Commission is saying the same thing, right? First of all, it's to all of us, right? The promise is coextensive with the command. If we believe the promise, I will be with you always to the very end of the age, is to every follower of Christ, then we must also acknowledge the command to make disciples is also to every follower of Christ. And we're to do that, how? Baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey all that Christ commanded and he just commanded them to make disciples. Multiplication's built in, and where's that ha- where or among whom is that to happen? All nations that we just talked about. All nations, every people group on earth. So multiplication is God's idea, but not all multiplication is good. Cancer is a rapid multiplication of unhealthy cells. We all know cancer is not good. I don't believe God wants to multiply mediocre disciples. So when I think of multiplication, the first biblical character I think of is Abraham. And I think that makes sense, right? the father of many nations, right? The father of our faith. You remember God's promise to him that God would make his descendants more numerous than the grains of sand or the stars in the heavens. So that sounds like multiplication. I think that's probably why that's the first place my mind goes. And Abraham displayed a consistent characteristic. Now, he was, he was not perfect by any means, and he didn't just make a mistake once, he would repeat it, like the whole thing with trying to pass Sarah off as his sister and so on, right? So he wasn't perfect, but he had something that's very central that he got right over and over, and that was his immediate, radical, costly obedience. In fact, twice God tells us why he chose Abraham, and on both occasions he says it's because 
Abraham obeyed him. Which makes perfect sense, right? Because biblically, obedience and love are connected. They're just flip side of each other. So that's why Jesus will say on more than one occasion, if you love me, you will obey my commands. That's why in 1 John 5, John says, this is love for God, that we obey his commands. And his commands are not burdensome, right? It's not an onerous duty. It is our rejoicing, our grateful rejoicing overflow. So obedience and love are intimately connected. So it would make perfect sense that if God wants us to love him with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength, that this will be demonstrated in immediate, radical, costly obedience. And we see this in Abraham. We're first introduced to Abraham in the latter verses of chapter 11. We won't go into that today, but there's some really interesting things we could pull out of that. But I want to jump right into chapter 12, where God calls Abraham to leave his country, his family, his father's household, to go to a land that God would show him. So he's asking Abraham to give up the comfort, the convenience, the safety, the familiarity of the urban life he's grown up in, in Ur and then Haran, and go basically living in the wilderness in tents the rest of his life in a foreign land, an unfamiliar place. He obeys immediately. Chapter 17. This is where his name is changed from Abram to Abraham as he's given the sign of the covenant, circumcision, right? Apart from the obvious physical sacrifice involved in that, there's also a major security risk. We see later in Genesis where his great-grandchildren wipe out an entire group, an entire people when they're all circumcised on the same day and they can't defend themselves as they're healing from the process. So this is a big deal. But scripture tells us on the very day that God told him, he circumcised himself and his son Ishmael and every male born in his household and every male bought with his money. And then for emphasis, it repeats, on the very day God told him. Immediate, radical, costly obedience. Chapter 21, by now Ishmael has been born, right? The son of Hagar. And um, Isaac has also been born by chapter 21, and Ishmael begins to mock Isaac, the son of the promise, right? So Sarah is upset. So she goes to Abraham and she says, you need to send them away. Hagar and Ishmael, you need to send them away. And we're told the matter troubled Abraham greatly because of his son. But God said to him, listen to the voice of your wife, Sarah. It's through Isaac that your seed will be named. You know, I'll also care for Ishmael and make him a great nation, but you need to send him away. So we're told, we're told he rose early the next morning, gave them food and a flask of water and sent them away. Immediate, radical, costly obedience. Chapter 22. This is where I lose my ability to identify with Abraham. Up to this point, you know, I could see myself following him in his faith, you know, being obedient. But here, God calls him to sacrifice his son Isaac. 
and I think that's where you would have lost me. In his situation, I can't conceive that I would have obeyed that. (laughs) I can imagine all sorts of excuses. I might have said, yes, Lord, as long as Sarah agrees. That would have been pretty safe. Or, yes, Lord, if you allow me to bring back Ishmael. Or, yes, Lord, as soon as you give me a son to replace Isaac. He didn't say any of these things. Again, we're told he rose early the next morning, saddled his donkey, loaded it with firewood, and set out with Isaac for the mountain where God told him he was to do this. Now, we know, you know, that God provided the the ram caught in the thicket by his horns as a substitute. Abraham didn't know that. Hebrews tells us that Abraham believed that God could raise the dead, and that's why he was going through with it. But at any rate, he demonstrated immediate, radical, costly obedience. And I believe that is exactly the kind of follower God delights to multiply. I used to do training for the there were five at that time major national house church networks in China. And on one occasion, I was doing a training for the network that's called the Born Again Network. And at that time, they had 16 million people in their network. And the people at this training, there were a little over 30 of them because they were the, the heads of that network in each of the provinces of the country. And on this particular day, that I want to talk about, um, our main topic for the day was tracing the pattern through Scripture of God's intention for redeeming for himself a people from among every people, tribe, tongue, and nation. So we started at 6 a.m. in Genesis and went to 3 p.m. in Revelation. Then we took a break and had something to eat. And then we came back, and I had a large world map that I placed up on the wall. And this is back in the 90s, and these leaders from this network had been cut off, really, from outside contact, pretty much, almost entirely, for, at that point, over 50 years. And so they had not kept, been able to keep up with what God was doing globally, and so, essentially, we were reviewing church history for the last 50 years globally. So I just went country by country through that map and updated them on progress that had been made, the strengths and weaknesses of the church in that country, the major people groups that were still unaddressed, you know, just kind of encapsulating this current status of Christianity country by country globally. And I finished doing that about 11 p.m., And the Lord spoke very clearly to me. And he said that he wanted to call someone who was in that training to go as that network's first missionary outside the country. Of course, they had sent many people inside the country to other people groups, but had not sent anyone outside. So I shared this with the group. And they agreed that we would pray for the Lord to reveal who he was calling. And so in that sort of a situation, everyone will pray out loud simultaneously. So everyone started to pray, and we prayed for about 10 minutes, and then I got everyone's attention, and I asked, has the Lord called anyone yet? And there was no response. So we prayed about 10 more minutes, still no response. And we did the same thing again and again and again and again and again. By now, it's midnight. And the seventh time, a woman who was sitting over on this side broke down, weeping uncontrollably. She said, the Lord has called me to go as a missionary to Burma, right, the country of Myanmar. And um, she said, he called me this afternoon 
when you talked about Burma because I started with the countries right around China, so it was one of the first countries we had talked about. And she said, I was afraid. She said, I don't know how to speak Burmese. I don't know how I will support myself. I don't even know how I can get there, but God has called me and I'll obey. When she said that, I shared with the group that when the Lord had told me he wanted to call someone, he had also laid a very specific passage of scripture on my heart, but I had not understood the connection or the reason or why that passage. And the passage was this. It was the showdown between Elijah and the prophets of Baal on Mount Carmel. So you remember Ahab was king of Israel then, marries Jezebel, foreign queen. She brings in Baal worship. And it swept across the, the, the nation. And so then through Elijah, God announced his judgment on Israel, a drought. And so now this is three and a half years later, and Elijah is essentially saying, enough is enough. We need to settle this. So he challenges the 450 prophets of Baal to a showdown on Mount Carmel. So you remember they went up there. He had the Baal worshipers build an altar, put the wood, put the sacrifice, and then pray to Baal to answer with fire from heaven. And you remember they danced around, they cut themselves, they did all this stuff, nothing happened. And then the time of the evening sacrifice, you remember Elijah did the same thing, except he added one step. He drenched it with precious water and then prayed and immediately God sent fire from heaven, consumed all of it, even the stones, right? And then he calls the people to decision and they'd say, we'll follow the Lord. So he has them kill the prophets of Baal and then everybody goes home. But Elijah stays on the mountain with his servant and begins to pray for an end to the drought. And you remember after he prayed for a while, he sent his servant to look out over the sea because Mount Carmel rises from the sea there. And the servant comes back and he says, I don't see anything. So Elijah prays some more, sends him back. Still nothing. And again, and again, and again, and again. And the seventh time, the servant comes back and says, I see a small cloud the size of a man's hand rising from the sea. And Elijah says, hurry, run, tell Ahab and Jezebel <clears throat> to hurry back to Jezreel so they're not hindered by the floods, right? And sure enough, God sent this huge downpour, broke the drought. And I said, now I understand. Just as Elijah prayed these seven times and then God revealed this small cloud, this token of what he was about to do, so we have prayed these seven times and God has revealed this woman. And I believe that's why God put that passage on my heart. She's the first token of a great pouring forth of workers in our day into the harvest fields. So um, I took them to the passage in Acts where the church at Antioch commissioned Paul and Barnabas for the first missionary journey. So we gathered around her, began to pray. We laid our hands on her. My hand was right on her head and then everybody was kind of all gathered around these stacked hands. So there's this huge stack of hands and everybody's praying for her and they're praying, Lord, bless her ministry, give her great fruit, provide for her, you know, blah, all this, you know, what you would expect. Meanwhile, my hand's on the bottom and I can feel that, first of all, just the weight of that many hands, plus they're kind of pressing down because they're praying really fervently there was tremendous pressure on this lady's head. And I thought we were gonna break her neck. And I was a lot younger and stronger. I used to be a, an athlete and stuff. So I kind of got both arms and both legs in there and I'm lifting for all I'm worth, you know, just oh, lifting up, trying to keep us from killing this lady. And so I'm praying, Lord, please just let her survive the prayer. You know, and they just kept praying and praying and praying. And you, if you've done weightlifting and stuff, you know, after a while, you start getting the shakes and it's just all you can do. But finally, they stopped praying. And so I was 
so happy. My prayers had already been answered. And at that point, I was really tired, and I just went over to the men's side of the room and laid down and went to sleep. I woke up the next morning, and uh, you start with an hour of prayer at 4 o'clock. And so I woke up, and I looked around the room, and this lady was gone. For security reasons, you're never allowed to leave these training events, except every morning two people are sent out to buy the food for the day. So I asked someone, is today her day to buy the food? And they said, no, she left. I said, she left? Where did she go? They said, don't you remember? God called her to Burma. I was like, she already left for Burma? They said, yeah. They said, you've been asleep the last couple of hours. The rest of us have been up all night. They said, first we gathered to pray to see who God would identify to go with her as her partner because they always go out in pairs, just like in scripture. Then we emptied our pockets of all of our money. We gathered it, we counted it. There's just enough money for two one-way bus tickets to the border with Burma. So we went down there. They caught the first bus out of town at four and we just got back as you were waking up. And what they didn't say, but what I felt was, I hope you enjoyed your sleep, you bum. (laughs) You know? Um, Immediate, radical, costly obedience. And I really believe God delights to multiply that kind of disciple. Am I saying God can't or won't use us if we don't love him to that degree? No. God can use any of us. God used Balaam's donkey. But I am saying that I think he particularly delights to multiply that kind of disciple. One of my favorite Old Testament passages would have to be in 1 Samuel chapters 13 and 14. So I'm going to just kind of compress those together in a, you know, fairly compact way. But Saul had just become king. One of his first acts as king was to muster an army. 3,000 men. He kept 2,000, sent 1,000 to be with his son Jonathan. And I, I use this term army loosely because they weren't trained, they weren't equipped. Only Saul and Jonathan had weapons and armor. The rest of them are armed with farm tools. And even their farm tools, they had to take to the Philistines to get them sharpened because they controlled the metallurgy. <clears throat> Excuse me. And so Jonathan took his ragtag band of a thousand and went out and attacked the Philistines. They weren't happy about that. So they mustered their army, brought together 30,000 chariots, 6,000 horsemen, and soldiers like the sand on the seashore. Saul and Jonathan brought their guys together, but there was a little problem. They were scared. So most of them ended up either hiding themselves in caves and pits and holes in the ground or crossing the Jordan to flee into the hill country, or going as traitors to be with the Philistine army, leaving Saul and Jonathan now with 600 men who gathered under the pomegranate tree near Migron and waited. Now, I believe those 600 were men of faith, believing that somehow God could deliver them, or at least that it was a cause worth dying for. But one man distinguished himself. Jonathan said to his armor bearer, let's show ourselves to the Philistine outpost. If they call us up, it will be a sign for us that God has delivered them into our hands. For God is not limited to save, whether by many or by few. His armor bearer said, I'm with you heart and soul. Do everything you've said. So they show themselves to the outpost. The Philistines look down and they see them and they say, look, the Hebrews are coming out of the holes where they've hidden themselves. They say, come up here and we'll teach you a lesson. So that's what they were waiting for. 
So Jonathan and his armor bearer scaled the cliff there and killed 20 men within half an acre of ground. A mighty act of valor to be sure, but in the larger scheme of things, really meaningless. But God saw Jonathan's faith and God intervened. He sent an earthquake. The Bible says there's a trembling in the camp. And the Philistine army panicked and they began to melt away. So about, by this time, Saul realizes something's up because he sees the multitude melting away and he numbers the men, you know, identifies that those two are missing and so on. Eventually, there's more to the story, but in the interest of time for this morning, eventually calls the rest of the 600 to join in the pursuit. They begin striking down the enemy. Then those who had hidden themselves or crossed the Jordan or gone as traitors came and rejoined the fray, and they began striking down the Philistines. And then in their panic, the Philistine army began striking one another down so that a great battle was won that day as the battle spread beyond Beth Avon and the Israelites regained a huge amount of territory. That is the kind of disciple God delights to multiply. We can see how his faith was contagious first to those who had some faith, right? Then to those who were just out and out cowards and in a sense then even to the enemy, right? God spread it. (laughs) I used to meet regularly with the top leaders of those five largest national house church networks and we would talk about national level issues and things. On one occasion we were gathering and um, in my mind this was a particularly important meeting because I was getting ready to go to the United States for an extended period of time and I didn't know if I would ever have the opportunity to meet with these brothers again. So as we prepared to meet the brother who was facilitating the meeting that day his cell phone rang and he talked for a moment and he hung up And he said, we will not be able to meet today because I have to leave right away. And I said, can't you at least stay for two or three hours so we can touch on some of the most urgent and important issues? He said, no, I have to go. And so I said, what happened? And he said, well, two of our evangelists up in the Northeast have just been killed and I need to go see if God wants to raise them from the dead. And I said, oh. I wasn't sure what I expected him to say, but that wasn't it, right? And so immediately I began to reflect, what would my response be if two of my organization's personnel had just been killed up in the Northeast. So I thought for a moment and I decided, well, my first thing would be I would call some of our other personnel up in that region to go comfort the families, take care of the bodies and so on. My second thing I would do would be I would call our headquarters back in the United States so they could start to notify their relatives and start coaching them on how to handle press and everything so no connections were made, you know, with the organization and, you know, some things like that. That would be my response. Why? I believe God can raise the dead. I mean, I'm, I know multiple people who themselves, their spouses, their children have been raised from the dead. I absolutely believe that. So why would I respond so differently? Well, I can rationalize all I want to, but the fact of the matter is that I had a lesser degree of faith than this brother had. I was like those guys standing under the pomegranate tree, right? This brother was like Jonathan. He had a, an expectant faith, a proactive faith 
maybe most importantly, a sacrificial or risk-taking faith that was beyond my level of faith. It's the same situation. And again, I'm not saying God can't use us or won't use us if we don't have the faith of Jonathan. But what I am saying is God delights to multiply that kind of faith. Hebrews chapter 11 is the hall of faith. And um, it's full of stories just like I've been telling. I mean, it's the same thing, you know, just recounting these heroes of the faith. And then he gets down toward the end of the chapter in verse 32. And he says, time will fail me if I tell of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, Samuel, and the prophets who by faith conquered kingdoms, performed acts of righteousness, obtained promises, shut the mouths of lions, quenched the power of fire, escaped the edge of the sword. Um, Let's see what was next. I need to look. From weakness were made strong, became mighty in war, put foreign armies to flight. Women received back their dead by resurrection. And up to that point, I'm with them, right? It's like, yeah, I love those stories. I love those stories. But then in the middle of verse 35, he completely changes tone. Others were tortured, not accepting their release in order that they might obtain a better resurrection. Others experienced mockings and scourgings, chains and imprisonment. They were stoned. They were sawn in two. They were tempted. They were put to death with the sword. They went about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, ill-treated, men of whom the world was not worthy. And if you're like me, something in you says, wait, something's got to be wrong, right? These are heroes of the faith. At the end, they're supposed to win, right? There's no mistake. They do win in the end, in the very end. But on earth, it's just not necessarily so. They all have the same faith as Hananiah, Azariah, and Mishael, right? Or Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. You remember under threat of being burned alive in the furnace, they refused to worship the king's idol. They said, our God is able to deliver us, O king, from the flames. But even if he doesn't, we will not bow down to your idol. And in their case, for some reason, God saw fit to deliver them for his glory. But in the case of these men and women of faith in verses 35b through 38, they had that same faith. And for some reason, God allowed them to make incredible sacrifices, the ultimate sacrifice in many, many cases, actually being killed for their faith and suffering in every other kind of way. And on this earth, there was never a visible victory. But God is still glorified just as greatly because what demonstrates his worthiness more than our willingness to pay any price, to make any sacrifice, to take any risk for him. That brings him great glory. So if we live this kind of a life, there is no guarantee that we'll see great fruit, that we'll see great victories. But I can promise you this, God will be greatly glorified in and through us. Whether it's through those amazing victories or whether it's through 
great sacrifice and pain and difficulty and suffering and death, that he is worth it. Let me pray for us. Lord, you commanded us to multiply. Lord, we want to obey. Make us disciples worth multiplying so that your name will be glorified as we bear much fruit and so prove to be your disciples. Lord, we want to have the love of Abraham who demonstrated that he loved you with all his heart, mind, soul, and strength by his consistent, (coughs) radical, costly obedience, immediate obedience, Lord. Lord, we long to have the faith of Jonathan. Lord, not to live our lives looking at earthly circumstances, gauging cost-benefit ratios, Lord, but having our eyes fixed only on your glory and your purposes. To have our eyes fixed on you as the author and perfecter of our faith. And Lord, to emulate you as you sacrificially gave yourself and served Lord, help us to be identified with you in that attitude of humility and love. Lord, earlier this morning, we claim to want more of you. Lord, honestly, we realize that If we are in you, we have all of you. The question is, how much of us do you have? Lord, we claim that we need you to speak more when in reality, Lord, you are constantly speaking to us. The only question is, how much are we listening? So Lord, we ask that you would help us live in a constant awareness of your presence. Lord, not not considering anything that you ask to be difficult, but Lord, just a greater opportunity for us to demonstrate our joy and gratitude for your amazing gift to us. So Lord, we ask that as we collectively take this position, have this attitude, and begin actually listening to you and laying everything at your feet, Lord, that you will bring tremendous fruit. You will bring tremendous revival as you send us to the darkest, Lord, to the least, the last, and the lost. We just pray this for your name's sake. Amen.